Well, good evening to everybody. As you know, we've been examining the Wisconsin idea and examining it as a vision, a vision of a partnership involving the state or elected officials, higher education, and the public. This partnership all working to advance the well-being of the citizenry. And that being concerned with the strengthening, as we've said, of democracy. In tracing the development con and con uh, the kinds of concerns about the Wisconsin idea, we've considered tensions in realizing the vision. Sometimes these tensions have been associated with who's being included when we think about the citizenry. Sometimes they've been, how well are the tasks of the various partners being carried out? Or, as in last week, what are the consequences when the pace of change and the complexity of change, particularly in the science and technology arena, render difficult the engagement of the public? Those things we've talked about. We've not, however, examined the new Wisconsin idea, that is, until tonight. The phrase suggests not just an imperative for incorporating matters underserved in the past, but significant revisions to this vision of a partnership. The revisions relate especially to what are the purposes of higher education? What's the structure of decision making? Who should be involved as we think about the Wisconsin idea? So joining us tonight, Megan McGarvey and Katie Lindau and Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Both of they are respectively director and producers and producer of the film Outsourced, the new Wisconsin idea. Both are graduates of the University of Wisconsin Superior, where they earn degrees in communication arts. And we have other UW Superior alums here tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the Wisconsin idea has served as an organizing principle across all of the University of Wisconsin system. This is a system, an operation with 13 universities 13 branch campuses, and a statewide extension office that is found with representation in each one of the 72 counties in the state. So Ms. McGarvey and Lindahl explore with us tonight developments at UW Superior underlying this question, does the principal as initially formulated and revised over the years, does this principle retain its meaning and force into the present? This question, incidentally, is not at all unique to UW Superior. Quite notably, it's been treated extensively in stories in the Milwaukee Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and other places centered especially on UW Stevens Point. And we could identify other places as well. But it's, a, it's an issue of profound import across this system, and many would say across all of higher education. So this is an opportune time for us to consider the implications of developments for the Wisconsin idea. What do these, these developments suggest about for whom are we talking about higher education? Who should be served? And towards what ends? What roles should be played and are being played by students, staff, faculty? And finally, what do all of these experiences begin to suggest to us about the new Wisconsin idea? I turn it over to our guests. Thank you. Thank you. 
So we just want to quickly introduce ourselves and our film. My name is Katie Lindo, and I'm the producer of Outsource the New Wisconsin Idea. And I'm Megan McGarvey, and I'm the director of the New Wisconsin Idea. So this is a, a quick film. It's about 40 minutes long about the program suspensions um, in 2017 to UW-Superior. Um, so we're going to play it. Like I said, it runs about 40 minutes, so we should be done a um, little, clo little closer to 7 o'clock, and then we'll be taking questions afterwards. So um, if we could silence our phones um, and make sure the screens are uh, silenced so everybody could get a chance to enjoy the film, we'd greatly appreciate it. Otherwise, without further ado, we'll get started with the film. Thank you. Superior is a unique opportunity. Not a lot of public universities provide liberal arts programs. Not a lot of public universities are the size of UWS. Not a lot of universities have the programs that UWS has. We have amazing journalism programs. We had amazing art therapy programs. One of the only ones in the Midwest. And one of the most important things about UWS it is financially sound and stable school choice. Something that Superior should have hung its hat on. It should have been really proud of that. Students really valued that. Nine undergraduate majors, one graduate degree, and 15 undergraduate minors have been suspended at UW-Superior. Students enrolled in the suspended programs will have the chance to finish their degrees, but new admissions will no longer be accepted. The programs have been suspended immediately and are effectively cut moving forward. A few hours after the department chair learned about it at an emergency meeting that was called the night before. If I had a hunch, I guess I would say, that I felt that maybe there was going to be some discussion about some minors that the administration wanted us to look at to potentially cut. That's what I thought going into that meeting might be the part of the discussion. So immediately they told us that this was about program suspensions. The interim provost, Jackie Weisenberger interim vice chancellor for enrollment management, Brenda Harms, were the ones presiding over the meeting. I was handed a document along with the other department chairs and to my utter shock and dismay, the theater major, which is in our department, and two majors in media studies and journalism were all listed as being suspended immediately. They also gave us a little bit of data that they used to make their decision. And on that sheet of data was the average number of graduates in the previous five years. And sociologists stood out like a sore thumb. We had had 11.8 graduates in the previous five years per year, whereas the traditional cutoff for the system is five. They told me that they used uh, a lot of different criteria to make the decision. What the criteria was, I don't criteria were, I don't know. I don't know if I could uh, describe the atmosphere in the room. There was shock and outrage, all of which I experienced, as did my fellow department chairs in the moment. I came back to the department and immediately sought out a couple of my colleagues here who I knew would be affected by this and expressed my support for them and that I cared about the work that they did, even though I know they were feeling very downtrodden by it. I sent an email to the department calling for an emergency meeting, and then I had to go to my class, which I had not canceled, but just told them that we would uh, delay our start. And I had to tell them that this had happened because there's no way I could pretend that it was just a normal day. As I'm going from work to class, 
that was usually my opportunity to check up on messages and email, any type of communication that I needed to be aware of. And there was one email advising that my major and my minor had both been suspended by the administration. This was my first inkling that anything like this was going to happen. I thought it was a joke at first, honestly. I was a little shocked just by the absolute scale. It seemed like rather unbelievable. So I went and sought out my professors, basically confirming what they knew. And what they knew was not a lot. Not a lot at all. And all my friends started coming up to me, my colleagues were just like, Did, have you read the news? That's when I read about how 25 majors and minors were being taken away. When the news dropped that our major was suspended, no one knew what was going to happen next. None of the professors knew that they had a secure job here. A lot of the students as well didn't know what, if they would have to go to a different school. It was kind of like free falling. What are you supposed to do? Where's the parachute? How do you stop it? So everyone was kind of in the dark. So it was a lot of confusion. And then it was a lot of anger. The students were amazing. I was inspired by the students and how articulate they were in expressing their outrage. So you guys keep referring to these data and these sources that you've put together, and yet you have not provided who has conducted these and where you've gotten them from. One of my great joys being a student here has been my professors has been working with people who are passionate about their subjects because I'm passionate about these subjects and they help ignite that in me. And when you take major concentrations and major programs and you relegate them to university studies level, how do you reasonably expect to incent top talent to stay, other top talent to join, and top students to enroll? Just to see students show up in droves, and then to show up and then just use all the stuff that they've learned at, at UWS and throw it back. If all the classes are still there because they're incorporated through the general education, through the minors, through other courses, why are you getting rid of the majors? And, and it's, it can't be because you want them to revamp the programs, because theater just revamped the program. And I think that it's very clear now that the three administrators that made these decisions had no idea to the quality and intelligence of the students at UW Superior. So I just want to give you a little background on myself. This is my first semester at WS. I transferred from Milwaukee. I came here with the idea that my education was important. I would be pushed to get as much of the education as I can to grow to learn. And now that you're shipping these programs, what are you going to do? Because I fully regret coming to the school. Despite what you say, or what anyone may say statistically about how many people were impacted, on a small campus like this, a small percentage is actually widely felt among the student body. I have not seen that many people at a UWS forum. It was crazy. The line was out the door. Hand after hand after hand. Like, I'm not afraid to speak in class. I mean, and this is not class. This is a way scarier situation. And I mean, these women were yelling were shaming, I mean, they were like using you know, all of their cultural capital to try to scare students into silence, and uh, students were not scared. Your mission statement says to foster intellectual growth and creativity. How are you gonna do that with the choices that you deliberately have? I attended all the forums. I had to voice my concerns, I had to hear the concerns of my faculty, of my fellow students, and I had to hear the administration's attempted justification of what they had done. Again, you may or may not agree with that, but this decision we felt, if we made it, we could own it. One program does not a university make. I, that, that, that is what it is. Um, it was important for us to be upfront and honest and forthcoming with the media and with all of you and with our faculty. We're committed to you as a student. But not my degree. For future students. We will make sure that every journalism major will finish the program. I'm not worried about finishing my program. I'm graduating this summer. What about the future me, the young one that comes in? Ribbon is me, wants to be a journalist, they can't do it here. Unfortunately, the enrollments and the completion rates were poor within journalism. 
So students, in a sense, have been making selections, making choices that have reduced the need for a journalism. So you're not laying on the students. It was badass. It was amazing. It was the best tribute to UWS I could imagine. And it was just so impressive. We know our students. I mean, that's one of the things that's so obvious here is that the faculty and staff, the people that work with students every day, we know our students. We know what they're capable of. We know who they are as human beings. These administrators have no idea who the students of this university are, which is, you know, a tragedy and something that I think is really worth some pretty serious criticism. Um, one of the points, and I know some of you have been in some of the other sessions that we've talked about, is the fact that institutions twice our size are offering fewer majors than what we are, even after these suspensions, which does make this unique, which is an impassioned plea for your program. I love how dedicated you are to journalism. We can't do every program that every student might want. And yes, you're right, we had to make a hard decision. in an age of choices. As consumers of anything, be it education, be it food, be it retail, we like choices. We like customization. We like the ability to make decisions that fit our individual lives. It was the fact that I found out that there was like specifics to the degrees here that I really like that made me come here. But I also found it, so I found it very condescending to say that Everyone is being overwhelmed as first-generation students because I am a first-generation student. The forums were something that they were doing as an attempt to placate the student body. Nothing more. There was no chance of saving our programs. There was no chance to reverse the decision that had already been made in an improper fashion. They knew what they were in for. They knew the student body was angry. They knew the faculty were angry. And they knew that we were going to have well-articulated arguments against this decision. But the thing, again, that uh, I don't understand is why they didn't create an inclusive process. Now, I, I, I think I heard uh, the interim provost say something along the lines of, uh, well, we, we realized that the program prioritization process from a few years ago was a challenge for the university and we wanted to spare the university of that occurrence again. That is so utterly insufficient of an answer for making such a dramatic series of decisions. Knowing what we know now, or even in the immediate aftermath of these cuts, seeing what a disaster that was, any you know, leader of any quality, in my opinion, would have said, okay, let's hit the pause button, step back. Yeah, it was just dropped right in the middle of the Bison. So that was really hard on the students. Yeah, one of the, this question has come, timing, right? I mean, that, that's what we're really after here is timing. And, um, we looked at this a number of ways and could not identify the good time to do this sort of thing. Um, we did feel once a decision has been, had been reached that we needed to move forward. Um, and, and again, recognizing there's not a good time. I, advisement is under me. I know we are right in the middle but of advisement. Back to the question that I, I also asked about a warning. We had a week to warn the students, knowing advisement is coming up, and I get the timing, that was a difficult decision, but there was no warning within a week of knowing you made the decision to tell the students before advising. There are many issues that the University of Wisconsin Superior faces uh, and the UW system as a, as a whole faces. Public education across the country faces. This is a campus that has always struggled financially, um, that has a lot of challenges, but the thing that always allowed this campus to thrive was the, the really deep commitment to mission and the deep commitment to students that the people who work here, including administrators, shared. Part of the problem, quite honestly, that we face 
as leaders in an institution such as UW Superior is this mentality of reduction, right? This idea that if we just uh, graduate five students per uh, year from each individual program, all of our problems are solved, right? Th that's the way the Board of Regents currently sort of thinks about the university. And that kind of reductive thinking is actually really counterproductive. Universities are really complicated things by design, right? They are not these corporations that just look at bottom lines, right? There are a number of metrics and factors and all kinds of things that express the value that a public university has. For us to succeed in maintaining our enrollments, we, we have to work harder, we have to be smarter. We can't just rely upon this region to just produce students who will come to UWS. We have to tell our story well. We need to reach out beyond our region. And when we've done that well, we've gotten students. And when we fail to do that, that's when we, we really struggle. Reasons and rationale were offered as the days went by. At one event or one conversation, you'd be told something. And at something else, you'd be told another reason. So before this process took place, we had 67 57 majors and 57 minors. UW Parkside, an institution that's twice our size, if not a little bit larger, has 41 majors and 49 minors. There was no rhyme and reason to the program's cut. For example, gender studies was not cut, but global studies was cut. Both of them are minors. There's no professors hired for global studies. Global studies happens with cross-listed courses. So basically, it can't be monetary, right? So there's no cost to global studies. Clearly, this illustrates that monetary doesn't mean anything, because these are both programs that cost zero. One was cut, one wasn't. They had about the same involvement of students. I guess it harkens back to the fact that maybe legitimately they thought that students had too many options. The problem is when these kind of decisions are made by a small group of people in secret, you end up getting decisions that often are not driven by good information. We also want to make sure that students have a clear pathway to success so that they are, are, not, um, they are not taking too long to finish their degrees. There was a task force the previous summer put together to study what's a national trend in higher education called Guided Pathways. And this is a framework to understand the most necessary, being the most utilized, the most highly enrolled programs and areas of study. And the task force was a combination of faculty, staff, and administration. Those discussions had nothing to do with cuts. Cutting programs never came up. That those discussions were in fact focused on looking at the number of minors on campus, looking at enrollments within those minors, how many students had declared that minor, and as a way to begin conversations and planning about how to streamline programming. Over the summer, we had a task force in which looked at all sorts of variables related to student success. And one of the variables the research was pointing to is that students oftentimes get um, distracted along the way with numerous course offerings and new, numerous program offerings. The provost or one of the administrative leaders claimed well, faculty were involved in making the decision on these cuts because of this task force work they did the previous summer. And I since have learned that a formal letter by one or two of the members of that task force was submitted saying, no, we never talked about cuts, we were not privy, this was not part of the task we were given. And I guess the other thing I would add is this has come out since when the American Federation of Teachers group did the public information request for the emails, it became very clear all of a sudden we had ev that evidence that faculty were not consulted and they didn't want to consult faculty. So that demonstrated very clearly, that was the evidence that they were not being honest and forthright, that they actually lied about people including, because they said, do we have to notify the faculty or include faculty in this decision prior to making the announcement? and system recommended highly that they should. They weren't required, but they should, and system legal recommended that they do. 
you can't just impose this on us. You have to talk to faculty senate about these things. You have to talk to departments and programs about these things. No, for example, in uh, sociology, nobody ever asked me from administration, why are sociology enrollments, or the number of majors in sociology going down? Nobody ever asked me. Through our union, we had done an open records request to get our hands on email communications regarding the program <coughs> eliminations. I saw an email in which the chancellor had written one of the regents. She specifically held up that online master's program as the direction the campus was going to go. And so I started digging into it, and that's when I discovered that it wasn't that we had contracted with a marketing firm. It's that we had essentially entered into a contract with what amounts to a for-profit higher education company where they take over the marketing and administration of this online program in exchange for a 50% cut of the tuition revenue. Privatization gives a sh real short-term gain. You can reduce your budget and you can reduce the expenses that are having to go out to run the university. However, that is offset by really damaging long-term costs, which include eroded morale on campus, eroded trust in leadership, a more defensive climate, when privatization occurs, you change and disrupt and damage the culture of an institution. And the culture of an institution is wholly dependent on the people that work there. The company is called Academic Partners. It's staffed by and led by people who either come out of the digital marketing world or the for-profit higher education world. And what they'll do is they'll go to campuses that have enrollment problems and are struggling with enrollments. And they will go to them and they will say, you know, if you can provide us with an accelerated online program that we think is marketable to a large audience, we will market and administer that program for you. So what they're doing is they're competing for students in the market segment that was largely served previously by for-profit online education. But for-profit online education has gotten a really bad reputation for sort of underserving students, leaving them in debt. What these companies are doing is using the content and the branding of legitimate universities to basically sell a product to the market that had previously been targeted by for-profit online higher education. And you see this going on all over the country. It's a way to kind of whittle away at what is a taxpayer-based public institution, really changing the tenor of public education. Of colleges and universities that offer online programs, Approximately half of them have entered into contracts with these for-profit, they're called uh, online program management firms. And this is not unique to Wisconsin, not unique to UWS, it's happening all over the country. We are living in a different environment now than even four years ago. Right now, as you've heard our chancellor say, we're, going, we're being scrutinized by the state based on your performance as a student. Politicians across the country have been reducing the amount of taxpayer monies, state funding as well as federal funding, that higher education, all public education, is receiving. That has been a, a very steady trend for a long time. There are messages coming from the highest levels of political leadership in Wisconsin from their own governor is that the things that colleges and universities have traditionally done for students don't matter. With regard to resource management, resources are limited on this campus and every single time enrollment declines, we're given less funding from the state. But that reduction in how much in tax dollars comes to support the institution is greatly diminished. And that's a political move, a very purposeful political move. It's a strategy that is anti-education and that some politicians will use, well, let's, let's defund edu public education because they're not going to be as successful if they don't have as much operating revenue. And then, since they're not going to be as successful, probably they're not going to do quite as good a job. Then we can point to the institutions and say, you're not doing as good a job as you need to be. I think we're going to close you and we're going to privatize you and we're going to take over what's going on. And let, let's say a more business savvy or private organization or company take the reins because business knows how to run things. And in the absence of campus leadership 
that's dedicated and committed to preserving the mission of higher education in Wisconsin. It's, it's actually very hard for faculty to protect their individual programs because we're all sort of at the mercy of people who've decided that the traditional mission of public higher education is unimportant. Public universities at least should be for the public good and not for profit. And that's one of the big theories that people come across is that they're turning it into a profit-making machine and some people are like, that's good, great, less, less harm on the taxpayer, but also less public good. Citizens have less of a say in what the institution does, policy they create, how they move forward, how they develop, what they choose to support within the campus and what they choose not to support, what they defund and change. Because when an institution is supported by both its constituents, which who are students, the people that pay to come, as well as taxpayers, they have an obligation to respond to and answer and work with those tax players to make the institution something that makes sense. So there's more of a partnership, there's more collaboration, I think there's more, it's really the essence of, in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin idea that we believe education is critical to the success of the state, to the economic success of the state, as well as the personal success of its citizens. Just as you are receiving grades in your classes, we get measured as an institution by the state and by the UW system. Sometimes we refer to those as performance metrics. Those performance metrics will be tied to funding. You are looking at someone who's doing the accounting and looking at balance sheets for the university. They'll look for ways to reduce costs. And so they'll look at some of the perhaps higher costs functions of the university and say, well, how can we save money here? Most often it comes down to employees be damned. They don't have to be state employees. Look, we can do this for so much less. So you see in Wisconsin, the state legislature slowly but surely funding higher education, education in general, less and less and less. In a lot of your responses today, you mentioned the budget and money several times and being factored into it. So which one is it? Is it a factor or is it not? The primary motivator was based on student success data that we were aware of. Did we think to ourselves, could this result in better outcomes in terms of our financial situation? Yes, we did. In fact, I think I would have appreciated it more if they, you know, had told us it was budgetary and gone through this awful process of, you know, deciding what programs to cut due to budgetary reasons. At least then we know we're like suffering together. What we really need is we need a higher educational system that serves the needs of everyone. If what is going to serve your needs and the needs of your community is, is an excellent tech school, we need excellent tech schools. And then we need excellent universities for those who will be best served by an excellent four-year undergraduate college education. And then we need to make sure that they're all appropriately funded and that the tuition is low enough that people can make the best decisions about their future path without having to be directed by their financial resources. The, the state looks at our four-year degree completion rate at the bachelor's level, and they also look at our six-year degree completion rate. If we can get most students done within six years, that they would look favorably upon us. There are things that data is essential for, right? It's a factor in a greater sense of decision making. That we need to use data and information to inform our decision making. But there are a lot of key factors that we need to think of as leaders in terms of decision making that data doesn't encompass, right? That data doesn't account for. And, and one of those is value. Universities and colleges are meant to educate and liberate people from ignorance. Yes. Not everyone needs to follow the same path. Everyone has their own path they want to follow. Some people know what they want to do, some don't. But that's why we have options available. You talk to a graduate and the value that they would express is not something that can be accountable in a number. Certainly a number that is, they're one of five or ten that graduated from that program. It's widely known that uh, students will change their majors multiple times throughout their career uh, because uh, 
because we're young. <laughs> we just don't know, and, but, we'll, but we'll figure it out. And if they were to give us the room to figure it out rather than streamlining our education, I think we'll be a lot better for it. What's more devastating is the communication or lack thereof, the way this decision was made. Um, what they're saying is, is offensive, quite frankly, to students. I was never overwhelmed. And we're here to stand with the faculty that are impacted, who's always supported us, and also the students, because this is a great place where we grew and we stand with the students. So there was action already building. Someone began like a paper petition. The petition needed to go online and needed to be more accessible to everyone. And I shared the petition, it just kind of took off. It has over 5,000 signatures. A lot of people weren't just signing the petition, they're also commenting their experiences on the petition. I started vocalizing about it, started talking about it, and the colleagues that I knew, let's keep talking about it, let's take over this organization. So we took over the Sociology Anthropology Club on campus. I took on the position because the students aren't speaking. There's students that are terrified to speak. And then among a lot of other people, it was just a generalized fear of where this university is going. They signed up for a university, and after these suspensions and cuts, it wasn't the same university experience they signed up for. I started this journey 25 years ago thinking that, wow, this is a great institution. We offer good quality programs and we offer good choices for our students. But what the issue is, what kind of institution am I gonna work what at? What kind of people am I gonna work with? And what, kind of, what am I offering my students? After students suggested it earlier this week, the administration announced today that current students will be able to enroll in the suspended majors and minors during next week only. We will open a one week period and give students that opportunity. We wanted to be responsive to that concern that they had. But faculty and students in the suspended programs aren't satisfied. I would like to have a campus dialogue about what the needs are and also what we need to do. They're also asking for a clear path for programs to be reinstated. If somebody tells me, for example, in political science, we need to have this goal in three years, this many students, this many minors, and that kind of stuff, then at least I can work for it. But you can't change the poll and change the decision every single year or, or secretly without consulting us, which is what has happened here. Losing faith in your institution, basically, in their honesty, you know you're investing your future in this university. The direction that they decide to go will affect the way that people view your degree. And also, I mean, it also affects your choices that you make at the moment. I mean, here we are in this beautiful campus and community in which it means so much. And our leaders, as you called yourself, feel a little like public enemy number one. I don't envy you. And for you to insinuate that you, the administration, are carrying the burden is a gross mischaracterization of what's happening. These folks are. There's not a long history of activism on this campus anyway. So it was amazing that it was like happening anyhow. So a lot of the people who are really protesting actively were juniors and seniors who felt more connected to their professors, who felt more confident in protesting. Three o'clock yesterday, we have been protesting this decision. We have had students sitting outside of the chancellor's office. We've had students at the YU uh, writing letters. The amount of support we've seen on this is amazing. Uh, and I'm just really proud of us for standing up and having this hurt. Yeah, the window's very short here in which we can kind of turn this decision and people were much too slow to recognize that. I think the faculty did not step in and step up in solidarity with the students and figure out how to support that and faculty did not build solidarity with each other and by December when faculty were starting to like you know rev it up and vote no confidence students had given up. We had finals hit. One of our people was graduating. They couldn't really do a lot. And we had some who just, they needed to focus on studies. And that's kind of what happens in an organization that's very small. We're also students. We can't commit our whole entire time to it. And you know, the, the freshmen and the sophomores who might have been, you know, a base for this continuing fight, a lot of them were planning on majoring in the programs that had been cut. 
And so from their point of view, I mean, and, and from my point of view as well, it makes sense that they would leave. So I think it became very easy for the protest to die down, especially one year after. And it's, it's really difficult. And I probably have cried so many times realizing all the work that I've done is this actually helping. Is, are we gonna get our campus back? That's, that's all that really matters. It's really frustrating. It pisses me off. <sighs> the university is putting their best foot forward. Much easier for them if people aren't organized. But you have to remember they're a part of, of a system that benefits from people being unorganized and having these people graduate out and keeping a lot of the people in the university now silent. We still have a warnings list. I think there's 10 or 11 different minors and majors that are that can be taken away from us. And people think that was the last blow. It's not. It's hard to feel a sense of direction, a sense of purpose, uh, in, a, in a broader sense, in a university-wide sense, when the leaders of your university have so casually disregarded who you are in the way that they made decisions, and that have never sought to make that better. When asked to comment on how the cuts have affected the campus, university administration sent us only a short statement saying, quote, we look to the future with optimism as UW superior faculty across disciplines are currently collaborating to identify academic offerings that will best serve current and future students. I'm going to keep advocating the students that re get recycled from the freshmen to just the newer students that don't know what's happening, just going to random events in the community from maybe events that are happening at UWS to events that are happening in Superior. It's definitely not forgotten. It's, not, it's less talked about now, for sure. It still comes up in casual conversation. I do think, though, that people have become more resilient from it. I think that this type of scare helped them realize how much their majors and their career path is a passion for them. I just applaud our community for the way that they've reacted. They fought and they, and they continue to do the best that they can. I hope that they don't forget what people like that are capable of doing and I hope that when, when they, you know, call themselves alum and, you know, be the upstanding members of society that they will be, um, they think about the people still in that university. And if they did it once, what's to stop them from doing it again? UW Superior's on the back. Scott Walker took $250 million out of the UW system. And I'm on the board of regents. I see what happens. I've been on the back end of a lot of 18 to 1 votes. If you think that you know your superior isn't on the ballot, I'm telling you, you're wrong. We have to reinvigorate you know your superior and all the form you can. It's kind of like the big bang. Everything's going to happen and now we need to start kind of taking those pieces that exploded and we need to make a new out of them. In spite of the anger and the frustration and the demoralization that many faculty and staff and even students feel, when it comes to learning, we're able to put that behind us and focus on what really matters, which is the education that a student receives uh, at this university and how that hopefully will benefit them in their future. People need to realize higher education is how we're going to go. So first of all, we need to fight to make sure that our higher education is staying. And then we can fight on prices. We can fight on the availability, the affordability of getting higher education and people really need to start thinking about it. It's, it's the only thing that's going to save us is education. Knowing, having the power, having the knowledge is going to keep us alive.
refer first to any questions, comments, observations from the two responsible for this excellent film. We will take up subsequently on uh, the issue of, this was entitled, The New Wisconsin Idea, and there are lots of things in there that capture the aspects that are being talked about for changes in the Wisconsin idea. But let's take those up after we've had a chance for questions, comments from our two guests tonight. So any questions or anything that anybody wants to ask about the film at all, or? Yeah. Um, did you think about the context, the broad UW system changes context that was going on at the same time? I mean, the, uh, Oh, sorry, I forget. I forget we're we're being recorded. Um, there was mentioned at the beginning the Stevens Point attention nationally. Um, I happen to be the former vice chancellor and provost of UW Extension, which was not uh, a very front headline uh, part of this. It just was declared to be um, usefully consolidated. Mm. So did you look at what was going on and try to make sense out of that as well as the specifics of Superior? Uh, we did. We looked, and we do have contacts in both of the UW Extension and in UW-Stevens Point, but when it came to uh, consolidating a holistic story that would actually be able to reach multiple people, then we can actually be in this space and then be able to talk about those universities that didn't get into the headlines or that did. And then it also gives us room to then follow those universities and like what's happening there currently. <laughs> Yeah. All right, other questions or comments? Yep. Just one, I think that the irony is that uh, the microphone. I just think that the irony here is that the Chancellor at UW Superior is on the committee to select a new um, system president. And um, that should give us all pause. Yeah, we when we found out that um, Chancellor Watcher was going to be on that committee, we we obviously have some opinions of our own. Um, what's more damning there is that the lack of faculty and students included on the committee as well. I mean, that's a whole another argument. But um, yeah, the administration at UWS has made it pretty clear that they shouldn't be in control of one university, let alone being being responsible for. Per providing for the entire system. Um, so yeah, no, that's a great point, and we definitely did not miss that. Hi. Um, did you learn, have you learned anything more about these performance metrics that were mentioned? No, uh, we have no idea what they mean. They've never been defined. The warning list that was included at the end of the film uh, has also never been defined. There's been no set of rules or any type of guidelines on how for any program to get off the warnings list. There's been nothing. Uh, if you look at the UW website uh, for UW Superior, um, all mentions of the program suspensions have actually been wiped off as of the one year anniversary in 2018. Mm -hmm. Do you want him to ask again? <laughs> so we can give No greater inclusiveness now than there was before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as of right now, um, there is a new uh, interim provost, and there is uh, there are new people in the administration now that we do know of that are trying to actively mend some bonds, that are trying to uh, veer away from this at UW Superior particularly. However, there is no news of uh, reinstating anything. There might be possibilities of giving them a pathway to potentially reinstate, but that's also only a memo that we know of. So, Thanks for the film. Uh, it was a great film and it tells an important story about um, this liberal arts institution within the public system, which is, as I think was noted, uh, quite rare. Uh, I had two, one observation and then one, one question. Mm -hmm. um, the observation uh, really pertains to 
the extent to which this kind of privatization or neoliberal phenomena might exist in other systems uh, as well. And uh, related to that, I'm wondering uh, if you all learned anything else about academic partners as a um, as an organization, because it's the title of your film is outsourced, and so it suggests that a significant part of uh, this story deals with this issue of privatization. And I know that the film is constrained by time and other factors, but uh, I'd like to actually hear more about what that kind of looked like behind the scenes. Yeah, so right now, uh, UW Superior's partnership with academic partners is limited just to their graduate programs. So all of their online graduate programs, with the exception of one, I believe, uh, is um, administered through academic partners. Um, and like you saw in the film, um, through their first date um, that they partnered in 2017 through March of 2018, they had paid almost $450,000 to this third party company. And those, that's tuition dollars for students who are paying to attend this university. Um, there's, um, as we stated in the film, the chancellor uh, is looking forward to the future of online education. That's something that they've been pushing and something that they've been looking towards which makes sense because it's more accessible to those who can't make the commute in, who maybe can't afford to live on campus or attend um, in-person classes. Um, but those third-party partner, those third-party companies are super problematic. They've come from, like, like we said in the film, from those um, marketing firms, from those private institutions. Um, we mentioned, um, uh, had a graphic up for University of Florida that was going to receive $186 million to, um, to give to af academic partners. They're actually tangled up in a lawsuit right now with academic partners on that amount because it hasn't been the amount of um, student promise that academic partners had um, given. Um, Eastern Michigan University, which we uh, included a little bit there, um, also has had a lot of issues. Um, and academic partners is just one of like three main players. So you're seeing it across the board. Um, I work for the University of Minnesota Duluth, and that's one of the conversations we're having now as we're hit with budget concerns and budget constraints um, and a $5 million shortfall is what does the future of our, our online classes look like? So um, it's becoming very popular. It's been very easy to sign up to for universities to sign up. Then they don't have to worry about the marketing. They don't have to worry about getting the students to enroll. Um, so it's kind of problematic across the board. Did that answer your question? Or OK, thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry. What I meant by inclusiveness when I asked that question before was student involvement in the various committees, uh, all up and down the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Has that happened? No. Uh, for As far as student involvement, there is um, something that we thought was too crazy to include in the film, and one of that is being the student body president during the course of those suspensions and that time that we just uh, showed you. Uh, that was the gentleman that just looked very uncomfortable between the three administrators. Yeah, um, He actually was very much with the students. He was with the, with the student body, and he wanted to advocate for future inclusive decisions with the administration going forward. I was actually um, one of the students that was asked to come to the meeting for um, the student government meeting and that at that meeting he was not even able to actually begin his agenda because they impeached him that day. And uh, it was as an eyewitness and as I was there it wasn't a very surprising thing to see the chancellor and the provost right behind me. So uh, that's as far as like student involvement goes. Students were still very active in protesting, but like we said, students, we want our degrees. We need to get out of there, and we want to start our careers. So we had to then focus on our own future paths, and it's kind of hard to then fight for it later. Mm -hmm. I think another important part that kind of goes off that, um, the, a big part of the reason that these programs were suspended was uh, to help first-generation students. I'm a first-generation student. I'm from a rural farm in northern Wisconsin. My family had no experience with anything re, uh, involving higher ed. I came in undeclared. I changed my major twice. I found the program that I'm in and found the career that I'm actually in right now by taking those other courses. Um, so instead of reaching out and asking first-generation alumni, like, hey, what's something that would have helped you forward and helped you graduate faster? 
Um, instead of asking those questions or finding out that I worked three jobs or that some of my classmates are parents and also work full-time jobs or that some program uh, classes are only offered every other semester, they didn't do any of that. There was no surveys, there was no information, they just three people in a room looked at a set of numbers and made those final decisions. This, the film and the, all the observations raised so many questions. I just wanted to make a few other comments. One of them has to do with higher education in the state of Wisconsin. When I said there are the 13 universities in the state, that's pretty large for a state that's not a large population, but it rested on the idea that education should be accessible to everybody in the state. And especially in early years when there wouldn't be mass transportation available, people had to try to rely on those places nearby. So that notion of education and that idea then of trying to engage in and the universities have long been places for the entire community. And so that's the other part of what these activities and when we talk about the Wisconsin idea then, it isn't an idea that was just to be for Madison. No, this had to do with what you could do and engage the populace, prepare the next generation of the intellectual elite we talked about, preparing for across the state. But what the film and what the experience at Superior does is to illustrate a lot of things going on that have led to this notion of there being a new Wisconsin idea. One of them has to do with budgetary issues, that you heard the comments about the budget, the significant cuts to the university budget. That, if you've read to, I don't to say if you've read, those of you who've certainly read the Chad Goldberg piece will certainly recognize in there the comments where he makes the case that a part of the partnership between higher education and the state was associated with the state funding the university. And so this notion, this, the kinds of cuts that have been so significant have had incredible impact on the institutions. But that's only one part of the picture because associated with that has also been a notion of a change in the directions that ought to be taken. When we talked earlier about the Wisconsin idea, we said it had emerged very much out of the notion that there should be responsibility for all segments of the population and trying to reduce inequities that existed in the state, trying to ensure then that state government would work on behalf of the, of the larger population. What one sees in more recent years is a strong emphasis on partnerships with industry, with the idea that the kinds of programs that ought to be offered at institutions should be those that can secure jobs in the immediate future. And so less, I don't think it was as obvious in the film about Superior, but it is quite obvious in one campus after another that there has been this effort to ask, aren't some majors more likely to generate employment possibilities and shouldn't the university then be focusing and placing its emphasis on those kinds of directions? That's a part of what has been going on. This film I thought was especially significant for trying to emphasize the role to be played by different segments because you will recall from the early discussions that for Bascom who thought about the intellectual elite or Diana Hess who talked about the kind of engagement of students from all fields, there was the, the idea that students need to be vocal advocates for what they are going to need now and into the future. And thus, the questions that have arisen about how things are being decided now have often been focused very much on what is that level of engagement by students, by administrators, by faculty, and members of communities in thinking about the directions that should be taken. And so the, the new, if there's a new Wisconsin 
idea. I come back to the question, how much is that, in fact, inconsistent with the very principles on which the ideas, the directions, the emphases that we've, we've talked about so much and I know that have engaged so many of you, those are the things that represent the challenges. I was very pleased to hear the comments about extension and while what, what had happened with extension because in that case too, no engagement with the people who were, to, were, were affected. So these kinds of decisions, who decides about what will happen if we're talking about matters of import for the present generation, for the future generation. So these are at least a few of the other kinds of issues that you didn't always get all of the picture, but how could they with, limited, with a limited set of resources in a lot of ways, but also with a, an important direction to be taken, a direction that said, we as students have a responsibility to think about the future, not just for ourselves, but for those things we stand for. The comments just now about thinking of the qu comment question earlier about inclusiveness, we've also talked about making sure we're including all segments of our populations. We cannot afford then to leave behind those who might represent the first generation, those who represent the more rural areas of the state. So yes, Superior is a long way. How long does it take you? It's a long, <laughs> yes, a long way from Madison. Uh, but that does not mean that there is any less reason for us to be concerned about how the engagement and how the idea plays out in every sector and every part of the, the state and the country. I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Gwen Drury, uh, who has been looking very much at the Wisconsin idea in the past, and especially some of these comments about the new Wisconsin idea. So I think she was asking for the mic. Thank you. I was wondering whether the administrators who you interviewed, uh, I assume then and maybe since you may have talked to, um, to what degree did they invoke the Wisconsin idea? And what do you think they think the Wisconsin idea is? That's a really great question. Um, we would have loved to have asked them that, but every time we reached out for comment, they declined comment or just didn't respond. Um, the comment that we have in the film from Fox 21 was the only comment that they, they've given within the last two years um, since this program suspensions. We reached out last December um, and we're basically told that the suspensions happened a year ago, period. Nothing more than that to get over it. Um, we're allowed to be critical of a university, especially one that we paid lots of money to go to. Um, and I think that's safe to say across the board. Um, so yeah, those are great questions. We would love to be able to ask them that. They've not responded to press questions. They've not responded to our questions. Um, local media reached out. We were in a pretty large film festival that was held in Duluth, which is just across the bridge from UW-Superior, and we were not recognized by our university as alumni being there um, and when other universities in the area were rep well represented. So I, we'd love to know what they think. And just also a side bar, they've been invited to every screening. We've um, wanted, like, we have not been quiet about this film, and we want to make sure that they know that they're more than welcome to come and watch it in a safe space. Like, no one's going to bring torches and pitchforks. Just learn. I just wanted to ask if there was a decline in enrollment after this announcement? Oh yeah, decline in enrollment and decline in um, retention, uh, especially going into 2018. The students who were going to declare in those majors that were suspended were able to do so for one week. It fell right in the middle of advisement. Um, but given the timeline there, um, 
students were like, well, let's look elsewhere. Even students who had transferred to UW Superior from some of the two year ca- campuses, which quite honestly defeats the purpose of having an affordable college. That an for- affordable university that far north in the state, we don't have a two year college connected to us. Um, I believe enrollment, I don't quote me on the numbers, but it was something like, I want to say like 16 to 17% of student loss and retention and enrollment combined, mm-hmm. which uh, it's a university of under 2,000. That's a large drop. Um, and there's, we've always had enrollment issues and we're can still continuing to have enrollment issues. Let me wait for the mic. <laughs> So um, I know this is just a guesswork on your part, but it, do you think that that's intentional, um, sort of living out down the line to some uh, lesser degree the university saying, well, it's so small, we're going to fill in the blank, uh, become a two-year, become an online, become an upper division school? I mean, it just seems, you know, it seems like everything is like right in lockstep for that to happen Mm -hmm. and be created by this administration. I, yes, that is a great question. And it was actually a big fear as a student being a senior at the time. A lot of us were wondering, is UW Superior going to shut down? What does this mean? Because when you abruptly find out that your major is gone, in a day and by the way it was Halloween we all thought it was a joke and so um, we were all very shocked by that and so that just kind of makes the mind go crazy and so from there I have reason to believe that uh, they are not going that path I don't know if the reasoning behind that may be because of the November election um, that just happened I have no idea But at the same time, we are seeing an increasing in marketing for the university. They are now investing more in billboards. They're investing in commercial spots. They're investing in doing more stories on their students, especially, I I mean, this had a bad taste in my mouth personally, but then um, they did a first generation student day and they're trying to highlight those 46% that they neglected two years ago. And so like you can see uh, like from you can see that they are actively trying to change that, and they are putting all this money to marketing. Therefore, it makes me think that now they want to reinvest and try and get more people to be engaged in the university. This is going to be, again, a topic of interest across all of the state, because as you probably know, the birth rate has dropped in the state. And so every campus then is facing the question of what are we going to do? And in some cases, that means stealing from other campuses. That um, Madison has certainly relied so much on out-of-state students and has gotten approval for increasing those out-of-state numbers. But those have consequences. So the competition that's likely to show up within the system and for, for the two years, the competition with the technical college system as that system also thinks about how it is going to attract in students. So these questions about what kind of directions are going to be taken, how are we going to hear the voices of everybody who needs to be involved, and to go back to an earlier question too of how might the administrators at UW Superior think of the Wisconsin idea. That question can be raised for all, everybody, Consider how in this, this class, we've heard people sometimes skirt rather quickly over the meaning of the Wisconsin idea. It's a slogan, not something that has directed in one case after another notions of the kinds of emphases to be placed. But that's why I say we have to come, keep coming back to the principles on which the idea rests and ask about <coughs> Continual, continued support of those principles and not let slogans be the kind of an approach that we take. So with that, I want to again thank our guests so much for the stimulating evening and for all of you for being here as well. Thank you. Thank you.